I would like to introduce Dr. Don Rolfs. Um, I was fortunate to find out about him from somebody who's here, he, and I've just been so impressed by his enthusiasm and passion and knowledge for this subject. I just cannot get over how fortunate we are to have people who care about a topic enough to dedicate years to it, to pour themselves into it, and then to turn around and come and share it with us. So thank you so much, John. Let's give him a warm welcome. to with Julie and other people, this would be a much better world. I'm pleased to be here. Now, if this works right, it seems to work okay. All the pictures I'm going to show you except five are mine, and the drawings are mine because I'm interested in native bees. Ten years ago, I was surprised as a 50-year experienced entomologist that I had no idea about native bees. I didn't know there was such a thing. And I certainly had no idea about the complexity and the number of native bees that we have right here in Washington. So I hope everybody has access to a handout. Look at your handout. It has two sides. One side is 50 bees that are native and one that is not. <clears throat> On the other side is one bee that has labeled anatomical parts. We'll be referring to the handout about seven times in the next hour. Okay. This is a mountaintop meadow about 15 miles west of Wenatchee. We're going to come back and visit this again. What I want you to notice is the abundance of flowers. Lots of species, maybe 50, 50 species of flowers in the meadow. It's a mountaintop meadow. Year after year, the same meadow appears. This interesting profusion, a mysterious profusion of wildflowers, and it's mysterious because there's no honeybees here. Not even one, no honeybees, not now, not in ancient times, not ever. It's a balanced biological system that's been that way since the beginning of North America. Native bees, on your handout, indicates that there's 600 species that I have in my collection or records of Washington, native bees of Washington. They've been part of this meadow for as long as there's been a meadow, and only native bees. They pollinate the flowers, and the flowers provide the food, and you have to have them both to have either. Native bees, what's a native bee? Native bees aren't wasps. Wasps are predators. They feed their babies live things like other bees and uh, larvae. They're not hornets, same as wasps. They're not honeybees. Honeybees are aliens brought here in 1640. Created a lot of problems that we're just beginning to understand. It's kind of like the issues about controlled burning where we thought fire was bad and now we know we can't live without it. Native bees are bumblebees and solitary bees. Solitary bees. And that's what we call them because that's how they live. Let's look at bumblebees. Bumblebees are fuzzy. They like cool areas. They live in high areas. They don't live in Central America because they don't have the high enough, cool enough mountains. In Washington State, there's 28 species of bumblebees. Here's 10 of them. I think they're gorgeous creatures. I teach people to pet bumblebees in my courses when I have you out on the weekends because bumblebees never sting. They, if you pet them, they will either shoulder you out of the way, mind your own business and ignore you, or fly to a different flower, but they'll never sting you. That's what wasps and other things do. Bumblebees are widely misunderstood. They're almost as warm-blooded as we are. We think of insects as being controlled by the weather. Well, bumblebees aren't. If we take a look at bumblebees, this is work from Bernd Heinrich, 2004. This line is a line of equal temperature. If it's 60 degrees in the air and 60 degrees in the body of the bee, the bee's body temperature would follow like this. 
But bumblebee temperatures stay about 95 degrees regardless of the outside temperature. They'll maintain 50 degrees Fahrenheit difference between their outside temperature and their body temperature because they brood their eggs and they brood their babies just like a chicken where they spread out over them and provide the heat that's necessary for those eggs and babies to be brooded. Bumblebee life cycle. Here's the way it goes. It all starts in the spring. And so you'll be seeing bumblebees now. You'll be seeing some of them the size of my thumbnail, some of them the size of my little fingernail. And you'll see them out buzzing around on the ground. They're looking everywhere. They'll go to a birdhouse. They'll look in a birdhouse. They'll look in a mouse hole. They're looking for a home. Because they spent the winter isolated, and that's all that's left from last year's colony is just the fertile queens. There was a nuptial flight. Everybody else died. Nothing was left. They only took what they needed out of the community. And these adult females overwintered in a hibernation state until spring when they start a new colony. So the queen emerges from hibernation, starts a new colony. It's daughters only. No males allowed. The colony of sisters grows. Later, the colony of sisters will begin toward the end of their colony's lifetime. They'll begin to produce males, new drones and new queens. There will be a nuptial flight. And guys, I'm sorry to tell you this, the price they pay is death. <laughs> drones all die. The colony all dies. Survivors? Only the gravid female. And she overwinters, hibernating underground. Only the queen remains. All the food is used. There's nothing left over. <clears throat> there's no waste. There's no excess. They took out of the community only what they needed. No honey available. Nothing else. Solitary bees. Solitary bees live solitary lives. They're single moms. Each alone. No help. No males helping them. No other women helping them. They're just individuals by themselves. And what this means is... They can have thousands, 4,000 species across North America, hundreds of millions of them, and they don't spread disease among each other because they're all isolated and they don't have to worry about hygiene. If you lived in a hive with a few thousand together, anybody in the hive gets the disease, and everybody in the hive has got the disease, but single moms don't have that problem. <laughs> they're the majority of bee space specimens in their species in Washington. Of the 600 species, 572 are single moms, 95.3%. Most are small to tiny. Look at your handout. Look at the box on the top. See up here on the screen? I've got it circled in red. Look at the box on top of your handout. Those are T-bobs, tiny black or brown bees. Those bees are so tiny. <clears throat> Look at the upper left, upper right, bottom left, bottom right. There's a penny in each corner. And that penny is a life-size penny. Everything on that page is life-size. Take your little fingernail and stick it up alongside one of these tiny bees and see that the bees are so tiny they couldn't even reach across your fingernail when their wings are spread out as wide as they can reach. These bees are so tiny that you've been seeing them all your life and your brain puts a filter up and says there's nothing important there and you don't register it. But I'm going to try to change that tonight. They're diverse in color and structure and I want you to be able to see that. Look at your handout. If we take a look on the handout and we look at B number 4 and we look at B number 11 and B number 13 and B number 20 and we blow those up a little bit. So here's B number 4. Isn't that an interesting, pretty B? Osmia regulina. Isn't that a gorgeous gem? How about Spicotes with this red abdomen? And look at the difference in the shape, the form, the color. These are gorgeous creatures. They're sentient creatures. They do mathematical work that is just stunning that we can talk about in the post-program session. Look at number 19, number 30, number 33, and number 41. Let's bring them up on the screen. 19. Look at the long parallel abdomen. Compare that with an almost spherical abdomen on the Anthophora. Compare that with a pointy abdomen on Celioxes. Compare that with Molecta. These are interesting creatures, varied structures, beautiful, different colors. There's 600 species that I have in just Washington State. Look at number 13 and compare its antenna length with number 38. Number 13, Anthocopa. Holy moly, we call those longhorns, and those are males. They're all males that have those longhorns. Now, some people ask me, where do all these bees live? Where do they hide? Because we don't see them. Well, you're looking at hundreds of nests right here. <coughs> Remember, they're solitary bees, single moms, living alone. 
we get a little closer, some of you can see that there's something going on here. If we get a little closer, you can see a hole in the ground. If we get a little closer, here comes one of them now. That's where they're living. <clears throat> that female got out, went to work on a flower because she is a single mom and she has to do all of her energy focused on raising the next generation, then she'll die. And if she does it well, the next generation will survive. If she doesn't, it's over for her lineage. So here's what's going on. She's dug a hole into the ground. She's made some, some cells. And she goes out and gathers pollen. And she makes a little cheese ball. And then she plugs that up after she's laid an egg. Now, I don't know how she does this, but she knows exactly how much cheese ball to make in order to provide all the food that that egg is going to need to go through five instar stages of larva and a pupal stage and go to adult stage and have everything it needs to make that multiple transition over the next 11 months. So she seals off all those, those cells after she's got them made. If we follow one of them, I dug these up down in Walla Walla County. Here's an early one. Notice that as the larva grows through the five instars, the provisions are consumed. This is bigger than this. This is bigger than this. And as we go along, she's figured this out somehow. I don't know how she does it. Gets to a larval stage. The larval stage still has some growing to do. And when the larval stage is finished growing, all the food's gone. There's no waste. There's no excess. They take out only what they need from the community. And that's all. That's not a bad idea if you want to have a long-term community. It's called reasonable energetics. So the adult emerges finally, and there's a period of maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks at the most, that that adult will have the job to set up the next generation, and then she'll die, and the next generation will be under the ground, where you don't see it. In the meantime, the flowers are served, and so you do get the flowers, and you get the food. Some solitary native bees make their nests above the ground. Some of them will take the pith out of the inside of a bramble bush or any of the trees that have a pith in the center, and they'll put their cells inside that, that branch. Some of them will actually dig a hole inside of an old dead stump. And <clears throat> when you see on the side of a stump a hole that's plugged with sawdust, that's not a beetle. That's a busy female bee has plugged that. And inside of that is the next generation of osmia bees. Now, some of you may know historically about Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber. And somebody once asked Willie Sutton when they captured him after he'd been robbing banks, they said, Willie, why do you rob the banks? And Willie Sutton said, does anybody know what Willie Sutton said? <laughs> That's where the money is. <laughs> so it's the only reasonable thing from his point of view to do. We know about cowbirds and cuckoo birds, and we call cuckoo bees, we call them kleptoparasites. Female cuckoo bee lays her egg in the nest of another bee. Why should she work? She knows it's got the right side of the cheese ball, and if she sneaks in there and lays her egg and it hatches first and kills the other egg, then she doesn't have to do any work. And that's about 10% of our bees in Washington State. 63 species of cuckoo bees in Washington State, 7 species of celioxis, 42 species of nomada. Notice that these don't look like the other bees. And in fact, you might look at Nomada and say, I think that's a wasp. And you would be well advised to think that's a wasp. It just doesn't happen to be. And I'll show you how you can tell the difference. But you have to have a microscope. 